Hello friends, welcome to College Road. My name is Jason. Thank you so much for joining us today for online worship. I do want to remind you about a couple of events that are coming up here at College Road Ocala. I wanted to let you know that on October 31st is our fall festival and we need your help. There's a variety of different areas that you could serve in if you're interested, but also we are in desperate need of candy. So if you can get some big bags of candy and drop those off at our office during our office hours, which is Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., that would be great. If you're interested in volunteering, it is an outside event. So you can sign up by calling 352-237-5741. Or if you stop by the church during our office hours, you can sign up there as well. There's a lot of different areas where you might be able to sign up to help us out. But again, the big need we have right now is candy. This is an amazing opportunity we have to share the gospel with many families in our community. So be a part of that. Also, we have a financial planning seminar coming up on Sunday, November 14th from 5 to 7 p.m. This seminar includes information about wills, trusts, estate planning, and other financial information. This is an in-person event here at Ocala campus. And if you're interested, we will be providing dinner, but we need to have you register online. So you can go to collegeroad.org, and in the main menu, you'll find events. Press that events tab, and it'll take you to our registration page. You also can call our office at 352-237-5741 to get registered there. Folks, it's time for worship. Good morning, and welcome to College Road. Let's worship together this morning. tries to roll over my bones Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear
That's where we are. Our fear doesn't stand a chance. Nothing in our lives uh, can go against our God. And uh, the fears, the anxieties, uh, the things that we struggle with, nothing stands a chance against Him. He's greater than all. And uh, this morning we go to we go to Him in prayer and we, we thank Him for being greater than anything else in our life. And uh, we thank Him for the way that He's given to us and the way we can give back to Him. And so let's, let's go to Him in prayer right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so, so thankful, God, of who you are. God, we're thankful for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we can know you and that we can experience uh, all that you have for us in this life and in the life to come. And God, we praise you today for all that you've done for us. We praise you today for the things that you've given us, for the way that you've blessed us, God. And God, I pray that as we give back to you today, Lord, that you use our, our, uh, not just our money, but our gifts, the things that we have that we can offer to you. God, we know they're nothing in comparison to what you already have because you own everything. You have everything, God. But Lord, we give back just a little bit of what we have in thanks to who you are. God, again, we praise you. We know that you're going to do great things today, tomorrow, and always. And I pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled. And died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. In Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy snow, Messiah still and all alone.
Well, welcome to College Road this morning, and if you have your copy of God's Word, if you will turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12, and uh, turn our attention back to the book of Ephesians uh, as we walk through the remainder of this book together. Prior to our Hope is Here series, we were in Ephesians through chapters 1 and chapter 2 in our Better Together series, and uh, we know that we are better together because of our common salvation, because of our our common calling in the Lord. And now, Paul turns his attention in the book of Ephesians uh, from doctrine to practice, or in other words, from belief to behavior. And uh, it is necessary for us to take what we believe about our salvation and about our calling and about our standing before God and about our relationship with Him and with each other. It is important for us to take that belief and now put it into practice okay so here's a question for you you have been empowered by God but now we need to be reminded that we must be dependent upon God in order to live the life that he's called us to so how do we live this we're going to look today at the importance of walking in power not just having power but actually putting that power into practice. Let's read the first six verses together, Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, in this particular chapter, Paul actually uses this as a hinge from belief to practice and helping us to understand what needs to happen in two really important issues for taking what we believe and turning it into our behavior. In verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What a magnificent reminder of what we have as adopted children in Christ. And we didn't deserve it, and we didn't earn it, and sometimes we don't even know what to do with it. It is so wonderful and such a gracious gift from God that He allows us to be a part of His family that sometimes it escapes us as to how great it really is. You know, a lot of people grew up watching the TV show The Beverly Hillbillies. I remember... Uh, watching Jed Clampett and Ellie Mae and Jethro and Granny and seeing all of them do the different things that they were trying to accomplish. It was a fun but many times painful TV show to watch. I mean, it really was just simply about a group of hillbillies that became rich and didn't know how to live. They weren't sure what to do with all of this wealth that they had. They were trying to get used to being rich. They didn't know how to act when they discovered how wealthy they truly were. So here's a question. Jed Clampett one day hit black gold. Now black gold is oil. And basically in his backyard, he was shooting for food, is what the song says, and up from the ground came a bubbling crude, crude oil, and they had it, and they had a huge supply of it. And, and now all of the sudden, Jed Clampett realizes He's sitting on the proverbial gold mine. Now, here's a question for you. How long had Jed Clampett been a millionaire? Did he become a millionaire on the day that he inadvertently came across this huge oil reserve under his property? Or had he been a millionaire the whole time, but just an uninformed millionaire? There are a lot of spiritual Jed Clampets in church today around the world that have untold wealth because of their relationship to the creator of the universe and the power that he has given to us and we are totally unaware of how to deal with the wealth and the power that we have in Jesus Christ. At least, we don't know what to do with it. Maybe we're aware we have it, but we're not real sure how to put it into practice. So how do we turn our belief in a powerful God into a life lived in power. Well, here's the first thing we must do. Remember why God saved you. 
He did not save you so that you could just sit by idly and watch his purpose be accomplished in other people. He, he saved you so that you would actually be a participant in the mission of God. He saved us to be his ambassadors, to be his messengers, to go out and do the work that he has called us to do. And the first thing that Paul reminds us of, really kind of here in verse 2, is this. You have been gifted for his mission. Just like everybody else. Paul says, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. It's interesting. God is the perfect steward of his grace. He knows exactly how to distribute it. And here's the wonderful thing about being an adopted child of God. You get to participate in God's wonderful grace, not just for salvation, but also for living the life that he's called you to and saved you to live. God places the gifts, his spirit, uh, the gifts of His Spirit into each of us in order to do His work here on earth. That's how He stewards His grace gifts. It's a concept that should forever change how we view the church. This is why we're better together. This is the place where the Spirit of God has chosen to reside in His church. It's how you experience His presence and His power. And he's put his gifts into every single member of his church, not just one, not just the Apostle Paul. No, Paul was just a participant in the stewardship of God's grace that was given to him. This, there's such a clear analogy that he gives several times throughout the New Testament. And it is the body of Christ. The head accomplishes its purpose via the members of the body. So, for example, when my brain receives a message from my left elbow that it's itching. My brain doesn't send down magic brain power to scratch that itch. No, what my brain does is it sends a very clear message to my right hand that there's an itch here for me to actually take that message from the brain and scratch my left elbow. That's how it works. Go take care of the elbow. That's how God works as well. He sends clear messages to His people, to His body parts in the body of Christ that something needs to be taken care of, whether it be in the church or whether it be part of the mission from the church to reach the world. And God sends us to go and do that. But too many of us are disconnected from the message that's coming from the Father or from the power in order to accomplish it. When we pray, God doesn't generally just zap His power down from heaven to accomplish His will. You know what He does most of the time? He moves His family members in His body to do the work through the means of spiritual gifts, through the means of His grace gifts that He's given to us. Now, consequently, that means that if you disconnect yourself from the church, then you're disconnecting yourself from the power of God in many instances through other believers to minister to you. When people ask, how much should I really be involved in the church? One of my common responses is, I mean, how much do you really want God to work in your life? Because a lot of times what God's doing in your life, He's not just doing through you. He's doing in your life through other people. But not if you've disconnected yourself from them. How many things have you missed that God wants to do for you because you're unwilling to be a part of God? We're better together. Because that's really where God's power is, is being filtered into. Remember, Jesus said, it is my church that I'm building and the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm not building Christians, I'm building my church. I'd also be so bold as to say, you really don't have the right to ask for the help of God if you're going to intentionally separate yourself from the means of that help. If you're going to disconnect from the church, then, then why are you asking God to help you when in many cases the way He helps you is through the church? God, I need direction in my life. And God says, yeah, well, wisdom is from the Spirit and the Spirit is housed in the body of believers at the local church and, and yet you don't want to be there. So if you don't want to be there, then, then why is it that you would expect God to endow you with the wisdom that He's giving to the body of Christ? God, I need help in my marriage. Hey, guess what? In the church, you can find counseling and support and encouragement and accountability. God, I'm lonely. Hey, guess what? Go to church. 
That's where my family is. God, I don't understand you. Go to church and ask questions and and allow the gifts that God has given to other people to bless your life. If you want to see God work in your life, then then you're going to have to be a part of the church. You're going to have to use your gifts and be blessed by the gifts of others. And here's why. Because it's a family. Hey, never forget this. And actually, that's what he tells us here. You have been adopted for his mission. Verse 5, that which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Look at verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We are part of the family of God. Is that not beautiful? Is that not an amazing concept? And isn't it also amazing that if we want to experience the power of God in our life, then all we have to do is come home? Come home to the family of God? They're not perfect. They make mistakes. But man, God is doing great things because His Spirit is housed in the believers that join together to worship and to serve God, to build up the body and to reach the lost. This is His mission, and this is what we have been adopted to. Remember, never forget why God saved you. God saved you so that He could gift you and use you for His mission and so that He could adopt you into His family which is displaying His glory and accomplishing His mission to the ends of the earth. This is God's purpose for you, but He didn't just simply save you for His mission. He also empowers you. So remember why God empowered you. God empowered you, again, for His mission. But let's see some of these Wonderful truths, verse 7 of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Several things right here that we're reminded of that God empowers us to accomplish. One of the things is really ought to be evident. We see it throughout the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, and certainly in Paul's ministry as well. We are called to reach the lost. No matter what your grace gift is, and you may have multiple, but no matter what it is, and stop trying to compare yourself to everybody else, but no matter what gift God has for you, one of the primary purposes for that gift is for you to use it in the context of the local body of Christ in order to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is even what Paul did. Of this gospel... I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul said, I didn't deserve this. I mean, keep in mind, Paul was kind of a, um, a um, very skilled and expert in persecuting Christians. That was kind of his job prior to becoming an apostle of Jesus Christ. But even though that was Paul's prior life, he'd been radically changed by the gospel and now God had gifted him with abilities to go out and make proclamations even to those outside of the Jewish community in order to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, just like Paul, you've received God's grace so that you will now share it. Now, you may feel inadequate and certainly Paul did. But it's not about whether or not you are adequate. It is about whether or not God is adequate. And you go into the world to reach the lost with the power of God in your veins. He says there in verse 7 and 8, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's not about how great you are, but it's about how great God is in your life. And what a magnificent truth for all of us to just take a moment and meditate upon. God's desire, His mission in the world is to redeem the world 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has given me special gifts from the Spirit of God in order to participate in that. And guess how I use my gifts? In the context of the local church, joining arms with fellow believers and going out to share that message in the way that I pray for missionaries, in the way that I give towards missionaries, and in the way that I go and be a missionary myself. You were called to reach the lost. But not just simply to reach the lost, you were called to impact the world. Let your light shine before men so that they might see your good works and be pointed to your Father who's in heaven. It is a life lived under the power of the Spirit of God that gives you the ability to make an impact in the world and to leave a legacy that will last for eternity. And it doesn't matter how adequate you are. It's about the power of God. There, just look with me real quick, verses 9 and 10. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Here, here's, God, here's what God's entrusted you with. God has entrusted to his family to his adopted children to his heirs he has entrusted to us the responsibility of making known to everyone the mysteries of the god who created all things now we don't have a special revelation other than god's word that he has given to us it's been revealed to us that he is great and he does great things and that he wants to do great things in this world through his children and we get to be participants of that and we get to share it with the world and because of that they get to see the glory of god and the grace of god and the gospel of jesus christ lived out on display the world doesn't understand the gospel but you've been called to share it and to show it with your life notice there in verse 10 so that through the church the manifold wisdom the multifaceted wisdom the multicultural multicolored beautiful wisdom of god might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places probably they're talking about angels here's what we see the people of the world will see this glory of god lived out in your life but so will the angels in heaven so will the rulers and authorities in heavenly places are looking down and seeing what god is doing through you because he's not doing it through anyone else, he is only doing it through his children. What a magnificent, glorious, gracious gift God has given to us. A calling to be his children and to be his ambassadors. We get to be the heralds of God, proclaiming his message to the ends of the earth so that the lost might be saved and so also that the world might be impacted. And here's what God's called us to do. We're called to live with boldness. You're going to reach the lost, you're going to impact the world, you're going to have to live with boldness. And you're not going to be able to do it alone. We're better together because when we're together and filled with the power of God, we are a force of boldness and courage for the gospel and for the mission of God. You were saved by grace through faith. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells you. But guess what? You must also live by grace through faith look at verses 12 11 12 and 13 this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in christ jesus our lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him so i ask you not to lose heart over what i'm suffering for you which is your glory now all of this really is a personal testimony of paul saying and showing how the grace gifts of god in his life have led to the ministry that he has led and ultimately has been a blessing to the church and how the church shouldn't be sorrowful for this suffering that he's experienced because god is using that to do great things here's what we know from this beyond a shadow of a doubt you can live with boldness because no matter what the circumstances of life may be god is bigger Whatever the world means for evil, God means for good. Whatever the world throws at you to harm you, God can turn it into something to use for His glory and for His kingdom. Even when everything in our life is falling apart, don't lose heart because God still wins. We know how this story ends. Live with boldness. Because you know, this is not our home. That's our home. We are adopted children living together in a community of faith serving together using our gifts to build each other up and to reach the lost to impact the world and we can do it with boldness because the same god that gave power to the apostle paul gives power to you 
The author of the book entitled The Word of Power Church, What Happens When a Church Seeks All God Has to Offer, his name was Doug Bannister, and, and he wrote about a historical event that took place in the spring of 1940. Hitler had his divisions mopping up French troops and preparing for a siege on Great Britain. The Dutch had already surrendered, so had the Belgians. The British army floundered on the coast of France in the channel of port of uh, Dunkirk. Nearly a quarter million young British soldiers and over 100,000 Allied troops faced capture or death. The Fuhrer's troops, only a few miles away in the hills of France, were closing in on what would essentially be an easy kill. The Royal Navy had enough ships to save about 17,000 men. But I, I don't know if you did the math earlier. A quarter of a million, 250,000 British troops, 100,000 other Allied troops, 350,000 troops stranded there about to be an easy kill for the German troops and the Royal Navy could save 17,000 of them. The House of Commons was told to brace itself for the hard and heavy tidings that were about to come. And then, while a despairing world watched in fading hope, a bizarre fleet of ships appeared on the horizon in the English Channel. Trawlers, Tugs, fishing sloops, lifeboats, sailboats, pleasure crafts, an island ferry named Gracie Fields, and even the America's Cup Challenger Endeavor, all manned by civilian sailors, sped to the rescue. That ragtag armada eventually rescued 338,682 men and return them home to the shores of England. As pilots of the Royal Air Force jockeyed with the German Luftwaffe in the skies above the channel, it was one of the most remarkable operations in naval history. But it is nothing compared to what God is doing through his ragtag group of adopted children. The church God's armada, a mix of flawed individuals from every walk of life, multifaceted, multicolored, multi-ethnic, on a rescue operation that has been commissioned by our God. I don't know if I have ever in my life heard a statement that is more true than that final statement that Bannister said. We have been commissioned by God for the greatest rescue operation in the history of the world to go and to seek and to save that which is lost and to share with them the gospel that has radically transformed our life. You've been given all the resources you need. You've been given all of the tools that you need. And yes, the church is a mix of flawed individuals on a rescue operation commissioned by God. But, we already know who wins. Unlike that armada that was uncertain as to the outcome of what would happen to them, we know how it turns out. God wins. And He's called us to be a part of what He's doing, and how He's doing it, and when He's doing it. And you get to participate, not in your own power, but in the power of God. This is our calling we are better together and we believe that but what good is it if we believe it and never put it into practice what good is belief that doesn't affect our behavior i, I would suggest it's not really belief at all because if you really believe it you will live it and you will live it with boldness because god wins would you bow your heads with me this morning Maybe you're watching today and you have never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you don't feel like an adopted child of God because you've never surrendered to Him. Not because He hasn't invited you to come home. But maybe so far you've rejected His invitation. Today I'd like to suggest is the day of salvation. 
And so maybe today you surrender for the very first time. Whether you click underneath this video or whether you reach out and grab that card in front of you that says, I've decided today to follow Jesus. Don't, don't leave wondering what it would be like to surrender to him. But maybe you're actually a member, a believer, a child of God. And yet instead of keeping your eyes fixed on him and receiving the power that he gives to you, you're constantly worried that you might make a mistake and fail and fall short. Listen, nobody thought they were less than Paul thought he was. Look at what he says here when, when he is reminded that he felt like he was the least of the apostles. He says, to me, though, I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know what? It's been entrusted to you as well. You can't just sit by idly and claim to be living in the power of God when ultimately you're watching the power of God do things around you and not participating at all. It's time to live with boldness and to say, I'm ready to do whatever I can do to volunteer, to be committed, to get plugged in, to be a part of the body of Christ. Let today not just be a day of salvation, but let today be a day of sanctification as well. God, you make me into the image of Christ and help me to be what you want me to be. Maybe you need to respond to God today. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us as a church. And I want to pray that God would help us to take our belief and to put it into practice. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. That no matter what the obstacles have been and no matter how many times we've fallen short, maybe how many times we've taken our eyes off you and we've forgotten the power that we have from you, how many times that's happened, God, you continue to offer your grace, to offer your mercy. You continue with your patience and your steadfast love. May we not just simply bask in the glory that our salvation comes by grace through faith, but may we also recognize that we're called to live by grace through faith. And may that faith be evident and strong as you use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.